You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Tuesday, December 4th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, from Mother Jones, Ari Berman. On the thoroughly anti-democratic Republican power theft. Meanwhile, it's Mueller Advent calendar time. Sadly, this one may not last until Christmas. Or actually, happily. Yeah. Yeah. Happily, particularly for the... I mean, uh, the Advent thing was a metaphor. The non-Gentiles. Election fraud in North Carolina looking like it will lead to arrests as well as a do-over. And new report, corporate tax breaks are costing public schools billions of dollars. Republicans stop a plan to lower Medicare drug prices and the CIA torture head to brief Senate on the Khashoggi killing. Meanwhile, Milo Yiannopoulos... At least $2 million in debt. Contemplating selling vowels from his name. Ah, I really like that. No, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) It's day four of the hagiographies as Bush Sr. awaits burial. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I was, uh, wasn't sure about that Yiannopoulos joke. No, no, that landed. Thank you. Um, we will be talking to Ari Berman soon. The stories that are coming out of Wisconsin are stunning, and, and it's ongoing right now. I think the votes are happening almost, or very close to happening as, as we speak. Uh, there's a lot of activism that's going on there at the State House. Again, I think we mentioned this yesterday, um, uh, But uh, call your state representatives. If you're in Michigan, if you're in Ohio, if you're in Wisconsin in particular, those three states, North Carolina, of course, uh, folks have had to deal with this for some time. But a really uh, important story. We'll be talking to Ari uh, Berman about it uh, soon. Also, this story uh, about a week ago, I flagged for you that in uh, the 9th District of North Carolina— For some reason, they hadn't certified the congressional race where the Republican had ostensibly won by 905 votes, something like that. And this thing's been unraveling ever since. And it appears we're going to play a clip in a bit, but it appears like there's been rampant, rampant fraud perpetrated against voters in addition to. Uh, installing a Republican. We will get to that in a moment. <clears throat> in the meantime, though, this is funny. Look, it's the holiday se- uh, season. And so uh, videos like this are, for whatever reason, particularly enjoyable for all of us here at the Majority Report. We'd like to see people fight. Uh, we'd like to see um, people we disagree with uh, be on the wrong end of uh, an argument. Um, And there's nothing more heartwarming than to see it all play out on national TV with um, Christmas trees in the backdrop. So uh, and a very questionable uh, dress choice from one of the peripheral players. That's right. Yes. No. uh, So uh, this is uh, the program uh, called The View. And um, I think they are obligated to have two politician daughters on uh, at any given time. So uh, Abby Huntsman and uh, uh, what's her name, McCain? Megan McCain. Megan McCain are on. 
Um, Abby Huntsman, you'll recall, uh, worked at MSNBC, then went over to Fox and Friends, and now apparently has landed on The View. Um, and uh, Megan McCain has worked uh, just about everywhere and is on The View. And um, apparently Megan McCain and Joy Behar are having a, a little bit of problems. Now, I, I've known Joy for many years. I used to be on her program on CNN. And then I was on our program at Current. Um, she's smart. She also does not take uh, much grief from uh, anyone. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, particularly enjoyable. They were um, talking, in this instance, about uh, George Bush Sr. Now, I think... Um, I think we've made our opinion about George Bush Sr. Uh, pretty well known on this program. Uh, I think the guy was, you know, I don't know enough about um, the history of the way the presidents are perceived to say that he was the most overrated of presidents relative to what he did, but I don't know if that's true or not. But um, honestly, uh, the damage this guy uh, did uh, far outweighed anything uh, beyond the fact that he appeared in public to be somewhat um, somewhat uh, appropriate. So there's that. But uh, here is this debate, and apparently it's sacrosanct. You don't, you don't talk about anything but just in a vacuum our president because he's like our daddy in a way. I want to say one thing about him that was not picked up, really, because as a candidate, he said, those who think we're powerless to do anything about the greenhouse effect are forgetting about the White House effect. And then he signed into law the Clean Air Act Amendment of 1990, one of the most sweeping environmental yeah. statutes yeah. ever. Yeah. This president that we have now is trying to unravel everything that he did and Obama did. And if I ever become a one-issue voter, it will be about pollution and the greenhouse effect and, and the we fact focus that on the president yeah. please i, you know, I just i don't want to talk about trump well, I do for for a moment so, of, we're honoring a great uh, president me a second, please i, I want to talk about but the we're honoring but i'm not interested in your one issue i don't care what you're interested in i'm talking i don't care what you're interested in either we'll be right back boy. okay <laughs> later christmas controversy a radio station just banned a holiday <laughs> It's <laughs> the most bizarre oh, thing. The audience. First of all, yeah, they're still arguing at each other. I mean, they're they're What's great as they they're not just still arguing. Like they're other. big. The argument gets bigger Clearly. as they end. Everybody is just laughing and smiling at it. it has that sort of like surreal uh, uh, quality of like um, you know Running Man or whatever, <laughs> some futuristic game show. And um, Brazil. Yeah, here they go. Very watch. Brazil, just watch. Later. And she goes. F you and and, 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 and and the other hosts are just sort of like completely. Um, and Megan McCain's like, my dad would like object to what you're saying. On such. Well, the the problem that Megan McCain has is that she doesn't want politics to in any way mar our, our our honoring of the president. And you know what? Like this attitude, and I don't care who the president is or was. This attitude that somehow, like you know, like this isn't just that. This is like a religious figure. This is like the emperor, right? We can't speak. We can't. We can't talk about mere mortal things. You want to talk about we child molestation? We can't talk about. I want to talk about the pope. Okay? We can't talk about politics in the context of talking about the president. And and, and Behar was being, at least to some extent, complimentary. Of Behar, Behar was paying the guy a compliment for actually. If we're being objective, something he probably should he should get a, a positive notch for it won't outrun his running the CIA or running the Willie Horton ads, but good for him. He signed that legislation. And, but what's amazing, I mean, not only is she wrong, but I mean, what an unprofessional brat. I wonder, wow. well, and, With and a lot actually, of sincere tension it's there, interesting like. that you say, uh, uh, unprofessional brat, uh, because apparently this is according to the daily mail, Joy Behar continued to fume as the show cut to commercial. Now, look, we could see what was going on there. They both were still fuming, uh, but they want to put this. And she said she would leave the show if this quote, this is according to the Daily Mail, this shit doesn't stop. (laughs) 
She said, I can't take this much more, Behar reportedly said. Um, she, she called McCain, quote, an entitled bitch. Ding, ding, ding. ding. ding yeah. Now, look. <laughs> I don't uh, appreciate uh, the use of the word bitch. I find that to be a little bit gendered. Um, I don't think it... uh, Now, it's one thing uh, to say it, um, you know, uh, off camera, as opposed to Fox, which apparently just the other day uh, literally uh, had it said on their air about Joy Behar. Wouldn't Joy have carte blanche to say it, though? Right. Right. In that respect. And, and I think and I don't think that she means it in a gendered way. I think her point is, is that M- McCain thinks that because her dad was a senator, she can get a job on TV. And she's right. Uh, that's how she got that job. I've worked with her on a TV show. And I can tell you that I have run into people who are more talented than her. I Actually, you. I ran into people who were more talented to her on that day, um, in in that moment. People who were not even on camera, who were more talented in terms of them being on camera. So uh, the idea that you know Megan McCain can show up on this show and tell Joy Behar, who's been on the show I think for a couple of decades, off and on, um, you can't in any way <laughs> divert di- like divert your attention to the sort of the present day politics when you're talking about a dead president, I think it's pretty impressive. I was going to talk about how my dad went golfing together and you're talking about like the greenhouse and whatnot. Like you're stupid. You're an old Jew. I hate you. Oh my God. She's not Jewish. Uh, Joy I Behar. didn't know that. Joy I Behar is, is Italian. I need but, briefers. Like this is ridiculous. But you know, what is, um, what is interesting is I wonder if it's because McCain is embarrassed by uh, her Republican Party stance on global warming. I wonder if that's what it comes down to. Uh, she well, she knows... has a lot of proxy tension anytime issues like that are brought right. up. I think you're right. I think that's part of it. But um, I'm perfectly willing to host a debate between the two of them. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it here. And uh, all I can say uh, to Joy Behar, uh, I believe uh, back in the day we would say, you go, girl. Ask the moms. That's right. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to... Uh, oh, wait a second. I get some uh, copy to do. Oh, this is great. Uh, the New Yorker magazine, as you know, it's an iconic magazine that represents the best writing in America today. Beyond publishing the best writers in the world, the New Yorker holds people in power accountable through rigorous reporting and compelling storytelling. Plus, they write beautiful pieces on subjects that readers may not have previously put much thought into, like the world's diminishing supply of sand or heirloom beans. They incorporate features like poetry, fiction, cultural criticism, and satire into every issue. You can get the best writing anywhere, everywhere, with home delivery of the print edition each week. Or you can read on the go with the New Yorker Today app or via Google News. Uh, the number of New Yorker stories that I have referenced on this program, I don't think it's calculable. Some of the biggest stories of the year, all of the reporting uh, that Ronan Farrow did, that Jane Mayer did, those big, big stories that came out this year, all in the New Yorker um, and more. They have a great... <clears throat> Great reported pieces. Uh, This week, why we sleep and why we often can't. These are all lined up on my my, uh, app that I read these things. Um, Countering Trump at the border. Uh, I, I mean, there's just so many people I read out of The New Yorker. Just looking at the Cindy Lauper's mission to help homeless teens. Interesting. Uh, all this and more, you cannot um, you cannot go wrong when you're reading the New Yorker. Either uh, whether it comes as a um, you know a satire piece or a fiction, or frankly, as some of the best and most reliable reporting in the country. Don't wait. Go to NewYorker.com/majority. Listeners of the Majority Report save fifty percent when they enter the code Majority. So get this. 
With this special offer, you're going to receive 12 issues for six bucks. Plus, you get the exclusive New Yorker tote bag. Talk about a gift subscription. Hello. I mean, it doesn't say that on the copy, but you can choose between the print, digital, or a combo subscription. Subscribe to the New Yorker. Read something that means something. That's 12 issues for six bucks and a free tote bag when you go to newyorker.com slash majority. Also, um, whether it's cranberry sauce that drops uh, or your uncle's smelly socks, I don't know why you would be dealing with your uncle's smelly socks. Just your own smelly socks. Nothing cleans holiday messes like Mrs. Meyer's Holiday Scents. It's available in Iowa pine, peppermint, and orange clove. You can shop your favorite scents at grove.co. Then once you place your first order of 20 bucks or more, new customers will get the holiday set, which includes free Mrs. Myers holiday hand soap. You know what I'm talking about, the Myers, Miss Myers, right? I use it. I think we have some over there. I have it here and I have it in my apartment. You get a free Mrs. Myers holiday dish soap, free Mrs. Myers holiday multi-surface spray, a Grove Collaborative Red Cleaning Caddy, and a Grove Collaborative Walnut Scrubber Sponge. If you spend 39 bucks, you also receive a free Grove Stoneware Tray to beautifully display your new holiday soaps. Um, I have got, and I've started to use this now regularly, the, the Grove, it's like, I don't know how to explain this. It is, um, they probably don't want me to cite that site, but it's like a site where you go and you shop for products. But all the products are natural products, like cleaning products, etc. And these tend to be very expensive in the stores, much less expensive uh, through Grove and um, get sent right to your door. So I am contemplating, I am contemplating, I want to be carried away uh, with getting, um, with asking someone to come in and clean this place on a regular basis. That's very exciting. And this uh, set where you get the cleaning caddy, the multi-service spray, the hand soap, all this, going to order one shop grove before this exclusive holiday offer runs out the stuff will all be gone come december for a limited time my listeners will get mrs myers holiday products a 60-day vip membership and a surprise bonus gift free when you sign up and place an order of 20 bucks or more check out grove and our special offer at grove.co slash tmr tmr for the majority report. That's grove.co. It's not com. Dot co slash TMR. Check it out. And lastly, folks, uh, if you're looking for the perfect uh, gift for someone, but you're having trouble, you can show your appreciation for anyone on your list by treating them to a gift from Mrs. Fields. Mrs. Fields had made a delicious treat for over 40 years. Here, bring the box over here. It's over there. It's sitting on that thing. Uh, from their signature chocolate chips to handcrafted frosted favorites and melt-into-your-mouth brownies. Mrs. Fields' gourmet gift tins and baskets make the perfect present to surprise and delight anyone on your list this season. At Mrs. Fields, their cookies and sweets are baked daily and always arrive fresh and flavorful. Ordering is easy. They can ship your gift anywhere in the U.S., plus you can add a personal touch with a custom message, company logo, or a family photo. That would have been nice on this, like a Majority yeah. Report logo on that this. That would be cool. This is a good opportunity I for like someone peace. to use this to Photoshop that on there for us. I like Peace Love Cookies. Could be like Zero Sum yeah, exactly. Social Security TMR. Yeah. Mrs. Fields even offers 100% customer satisfaction guarantee. This year, send a fresh-baked gift. No one can resist. Let me give you a sense of what my feeling was about the cookies and brownies. The brownies were nuts. I don't think there was nuts in them. There may have been, but I don't remember. But they were nuts in terms of good. This is what I thought about the Mrs. Fields. Completely gone now. Like, <laughs> it was more like, I got to, I'm just, guys, take some of these because I'm just going to have, well, all right. Well, guys, you got to take more of these because I'm going to, okay. And then I ate it all. I didn't eat it all, but 
A great deal. Everybody else got, got some, right? Brendan, you got some? I got some. Matt did. Michael was the only one who did not. I passed. Sorry about that, buddy. I wish. Hey, right now, get 20% off your order when you go to mrsfields.com. Enter promo code MAJORITY. That's 20% off any gift at mrsfields.com. Promo code MAJORITY. mrsfields.com. Promo code MAJORITY. Check it out. You're going to love it. Delicious. And a sweet gift. Put a picture of the kids on the box and send it to the folks. And then they get to keep the tin. I'm going to bring that tin to Saul. All right, folks, I'm uh, going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Ari Berman about what's going on in Wisconsin. It's also going on in uh, Michigan and in Illinois, uh, excuse me, in Ohio. It has happened in North Carolina. Uh, one note, we had a technical difficulty when we recorded this. The video is not there, so we're just going to basically go to a wide shot with uh, Ari on the screen, right? And... Um, uh, We'll play the audio, and we'll be back in just a few, uh, right back after this. Driving all night, you could be a shadow. So, Ari, uh, this is um, what we're seeing right now in Wisconsin. In fact, I think uh, we're, we're pre-taping this just, uh, uh, you know, a little bit before noon, but I, I think around noon or so, uh, they're going to start voting in uh, on the floor. It's passed the committee. For, let's start with what's happening in Wisconsin, and then we will uh, talk about the other states. But um, this is this has that feel of like uh, somebody in Alec came up with this idea ten years ago, and they're finally having the opportunity to use it. Well, it's just really incredible. I mean, what's happening in Wisconsin is you do everything you can to try to rig an election through massive gerrymandering, through voter suppression, through unlimited dark money. And then when all of that doesn't work, when Democrats still manage to win and Democrats won every statewide election in Wisconsin in 2018, including the governor's office, then what you do is you go back into session in the lame duck when nobody's supposed to be paying attention and you introduce all of these bills that strip the incoming democratic governor of power that strip the incoming democratic attorney general of power that make it harder to vote that really it's a hundred and forty one page bill so we're talking about a lot of different stuff they're doing uh, right before scott walker leaves office and republicans will no longer have this crazy Republican majority that they've had for the last decade. So it really is, we overuse the word unprecedented, I think, a lot. Um, but according to an actual analysis by the Wisconsin Legislative Study Branch, they have said this is the first time in state history that we a special legislative session to strip power from the other party. So, I mean, it really is unprecedented in Wisconsin, even though they are barring some tactics that have been used in other states. So, OK, I, I mean, I think people are and, and I want to go through the, the, the specifics of it. But uh, and, and the idea that it's a hundred and forty some odd page bill suggests to me that this is something they've been working on for an extended period of time, getting ready for this potential potentiality, I guess. But how is it? Well, yeah, they, yeah. Go, they, no, go ahead. They, I mean, they started discussing it with Scott Walker staff even before the election. So evidently Walker uh, wasn't too confident about his reelection prospects. But Republicans did this in North Carolina. And, and what I always say is that North Carolina is really the state where every terrible Republican policy gets exported from. I'd say Wisconsin and North Carolina are the two Republican states more than any other that export the most terrible Republican policies. Uh, and, and so it kind of goes back on uh, where the policy comes from. But in 2016, the same thing happened, which is that North Carolina had a Republican supermajority in the legislature. Suddenly, they elected a Democratic governor in 2016, and they held this special legislative session where they stripped the Democratic governor of all of these powers, including his ability to appoint a majority in the State Board of Elections, which is huge in a state with constant election battles. We're seeing a huge voter fraud, election fraud scandal playing out right now in North Carolina, where Republicans basically tried to steal a congressional election. Um, and, and so that was the model. Uh, and I think we probably should have been more prepared for it, that once Democrats had big victories in 2018, 
2018, we should have been prepared for Republicans to come in in a lame duck session and do in Wisconsin and other states what they did in North Carolina in 2016. All right. All right. We're getting ahead of ourselves because I was going to ask you about that preparation here. But what is it that makes you th- what, what, why is it that North Carolina and Wisconsin are are the exporters of these things? What they almost seem to be like the Petri dishes. Is it a function of them being both sort of like purplish states in a red state? You don't need to do this type of thing because you just have electoral control in a blue state. You can't. I mean, what is it? Exactly, that they are emblematic of being purple states in very important regions. So North Carolina is is one of the most competitive, if not the most competitive, southern state right now when it comes to election. Wisconsin is the quintessential swing state in the Midwest when it comes to election. I think in, in Wisconsin... A decade ago, the Koch brothers and others made a very conscious choice that if they could turn one of the most progressive states historically in the country uh, into a laboratory for the conservative movement, that would have an impact not just in Wisconsin, but in other states as well, which is why they poured so much money into attacking unions and doing gerrymandering and, and passing voter suppression laws and all the things they've done. And they've tried to export that around the country. In North Carolina, you really have a state where the demographics have, are changing. It's emblematic of what's happening in other states in the country states in the south like georgia i think they're incredibly worried that if they lose wisconsin if they lose north carolina they're going to lose their footholds in the midwest they're going to lose their footholds in the south and so they are just doing anything they can uh, to try to strip democrats of power and to try to prevent the changing demographics of the country and the changing demographics of the state from from having political power because so many of the voting changes in Wisconsin and North Carolina have been aimed at trying to disenfranchise black voters, whether it's black voters in North Carolina or whether it's black voters in, in places like Milwaukee and Wisconsin. Okay, so let's go through um, w- what they're doing specifically in Wisconsin. Uh, but before we do, like, I mean, how is this legal? <laughs> Right. Like, I mean, how is it that you can attack the structure of government this way? Or how is it that the structure of the state government is this vulnerable to an attack by an outgoing lame duck um, legis- you know, like legislator? Like, I, it just seems to me that this is almost like a parody, right? Like, oh, I lost the election. I will passing a law that I can't lose elections. I mean, it's sort of like that. Yeah, I right? mean, it is. It- it, 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 I mean, it is straight out of a banana republic. And in fact, it might not be legal. Uh, in North Carolina, a lot of the things they've done in that lame duck session in 2016 have been challenged and overturned by the courts. Of course, these parties have put a tremendous amount of effort into changing the courts, just like Donald Trump and the Republicans have nationally, uh, to try to get a friendlier audience when these laws are challenged in court. But, but absolutely, this kind of thing is going to be challenged. I mean, just to give you one example, in Wisconsin, one of the things they're doing is they're cutting early voting. Uh, some places in Wisconsin offer up to six weeks of early voting, uh, and they had record turnout in 2018 with early voting. Now they're cutting early voting uh, to two weeks. Uh, Wisconsin already cut early voting, and it was challenged in court, and the court said that that was done to, in the court's words, suppress the reliably Democratic black voters in Milwaukee. So, I mean, it was pretty clear uh, why Republicans did this the first time, and essentially they're doing the same thing they, that, that was already struck down in court. Um, so I think there's going to be, I think there, a lot of this stuff is going to be challenged, but the, the bigger question is why do we even have these lame duck legislative sessions? Why do people that uh, that have, have already lost the election get to convene uh, under the old rules. And I think there's just another irony here, which is that uh, Republicans have gerrymandered Wisconsin so effectively that in the legislature, they got 46% of votes, candidates for the Wisconsin legislature got 46% of votes, and they got 63% of seats. So, I mean, you really have a minority party doing majority rule and stripping power from the candidate and Tony Evers, the Democratic winner for governor, who actually got the most votes. So you have the party that got the least amount of votes trying to strip power from the guy who just got the most votes, which is, I mean, any way you slice it, this is just unbelievably undemocratic. Um, and uh, my understanding is they were going to attempt to um, separate the presidential primary election from the state Supreme Court elections, they could not pass that. And the idea would be that, you know, apparently Republicans will come out for a sort of like a non-presidential election at a higher rate. Is that the idea? 
and and that was this was just un- this is this is unbelievable. I mean, Wisconsin has a presidential primary in April, which presumably in 2020 will will a lot of people will be paying attention. They also have a, a race for Supreme Court, and and right now there's there's a four to three major conservative majority in the Wisconsin Supreme Court, which has upheld pretty much every terrible thing Scott Walker has done. Uh, they are uh, very worried. Republicans are very worried they're going to lose that majority. So what they tried to do is move the primary one month up in March for no other reason that there were then any special election for the Supreme Court in April, which is just, I mean, it's so transparent. It would have cost the state uh, $7 million. Every single county clerk in Wisconsin, regardless of their political affiliation, was opposed to this, because then you have to do two separate ballots just a month apart. It right. would be completely confusing for voters. I mean, and, and basically, Wisconsin Republicans admitted that they did this to just try to protect their Supreme Court justice. So, I mean, we're, we're dealing with such a level of contempt for democracy, Sam. And one of the things that disturbs me is that I don't think the media is prepared to cover this. They are so ingrained to do both sides, to say, well, both sides are doing it. Um, and there is no both sides of the story. There w- isn't a single example of a Democratic legislature going into a lame duck to strip the incoming Republican governor or attorney general or secretary of state of power. There's n- nowhere even close to that. But here you have a clear case. This is only Republicans doing it. Only Republicans are passing laws that make it harder to vote. Only Republicans are falsely accusing Democrats of stealing elections. And only Republicans are doing unprecedented lame duck sessions to try to strip Democrats of power. And so I think you have a clear asymmetry, asymmetry in terms of the strategy here. But I think so many of the media are so ingrained to do both sidesism or so afraid of saying one party is doing this, the other party isn't. That I don't think they're going to adequately cover what's going on. Yeah, I saw a tweet today from, um, I can't remember the news outlet, but the the headline was something to the effect of, like, uh, Wisconsin Republicans seek to enhance power. You know, like something just sort of so benign and, oh, yeah, politics as usual. Um, All right, let's talk about the other states. And then I want to talk about this idea of not just the uh, asymmetry and what can be done, but what hasn't been done. I mean, because let's go to North Carolina, because we saw this in North Carolina two or three years ago. North Carolina, there was a real feel, particularly like three or four years ago, um, at the at the height of the Moral Mondays um, campaign by Reverend Barber, which continues, I think, uh, you know, throughout those, uh, at least in North Carolina, maybe a couple other states. But it. It really had a sense of like, wow, this is completely, this is like a rogue situation. We're never going to see this. This is embarrassing. There's something embarrassing about North Carolina. And now it seems to be a template. But w- let's just revisit North Carolina. But then talk about, because you cover this all the time, as well as anybody I know, you're on top of not just the voting stuff, but this this broadly, this type of thing. And I would imagine you would be aware if, um, you know, I'm going to this is sort of a joke, but David Axelrod was starting a group to make sure to protect democracy or something. (laughs) You know, I know he's done a podcast, but uh, but what what tell us about North Carolina and then let's talk about why we're not seeing any type of response by Democrats institutionally. Well, I I think so. what, What North Carolina did is, I mean, First off, they just passed all these laws to make it harder to vote, which was then struck down in court. Then when a Democrat actually won the governor's race in 2016, the first thing they did in this lame duck session strip that Democratic governor of power. Um, and that model is now being exported to Wisconsin, Michigan, and, and other states. Uh, then they, because their voter ID law was struck down in court, and, 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 and the court said that this law, along with a bunch of other things like cutting early voting and eliminating same-day voter registration, they said it targeted black voters with, quote, almost surgical precision. So then they put a constitutional amendment on the ballot requiring photo ID to vote. But they didn't write anything else other than should we require photo ID to vote? And it passed with 60% of the vote, which I don't think is that surprising because there was, there was no details in terms of what people were supporting. And people were like, yeah, we should require photo ID to vote. But then the legislature actually had to write the bill. And what happened in the last election was that Republicans lost their legislative supermajority in 2018, meaning that they can no longer sustain vetoes from the Democratic governor. So instead of waiting until the next year, there's no rush to write this bill. Instead of waiting until the next year to write this bill, they are now writing the voter ID law 
in a lame duck session, so the Democratic governor will be unable to veto it. So, I mean, first they strip the Democratic governor of power in 2016, then they go in the lame duck session and pass a very controversial law that he'll be unable to veto uh, in this session because they still have a super, super majority until January. The last thing I'll say is there has been all this rhetoric from Republicans about voter fraud in North Carolina and the need to pass this voter ID law to stop voter fraud. Well, the voter ID law, interestingly enough, only deals with one kind of fraud, in-person voter impersonation, which is incredibly rare. Me going up to the polls and saying, I'm Sam Cedar and trying to vote under your name, which almost never happens. They are exempting absentee ballots from counting towards the ID requirement. Now we know why. Now we know why. Now we know why. Because there is a huge scandal, the most blatant case of election fraud that I've ever seen in modern American politics, where Republicans in rural North Carolina this went is congressional around district, and basically... This is Congressional District 9. Oh, the we ninth Congressional District. We mentioned, I think, about a yeah. week ago, I said, you know, for some reason... They're not certifying it. They haven't quite said yet, but there seems to be one area where there's just something really bizarre going on. And we're still getting details on what's happening, but it's pretty clear that uh, a few things happened. One is that they uh, may have forged or fraudulently submitted a bunch of absentee ballots on behalf of the Republican candidate. It's also clear that people, Republican operatives, went door to door particularly to elderly African Americans, took their ballots and dumped them because uh, there is well, an unusually high rate, an exceedingly high rate of absentee ballots for the Republican candidate only. And then there's a bunch of reports of people not getting their absentee ballots counted, but people going to their door and collecting them. My, so my, understand, my understanding is I saw a report last night uh, that they, they not only had hired people to go to the doors to pick them up, but instead of delivering them back to the uh, um, uh, county electoral uh, c- commission, they brought them to the campaign manager of the Republican candidate. They brought them to his house, the ballots. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and people, people should and probably will go to jail for this. I mean, this was a criminal conspiracy to try to... But the, the point I just wanted to finish making was that if you were going to deal with election fraud, voter fraud in North Carolina, the first thing you would do is look at absentee ballots. That's the only place where there's some evidence of fraud. But the voter ID law exempts absentee ballots because that is where Republicans are more likely to vote, and clearly that is where Republicans are more likely to try to steal an election. So it's just an unbelievable charade to me that they are pushing ahead with a voter ID law that they claim is necessary to stop fraud while exempting the very type of fraud that their party is committing because that benefits them politically. I mean, if the media can't cover this and show that this is such a charade, I don't know what they can cover because this is so obvious uh, what what is happening here um, in North Carolina. And I mean, just, you know, all of the people in the last election, Donald Trump, Marco Rubio, Rick Scott, Paul Ryan, Lindsey Graham, who accused Democrats of stealing elections with absolutely no evidence, complete lies, are now haven't said a word about actual election fraud occurring in North Carolina. All right. So we have this going on in North Carolina and we have a similar dynamic in, in, in Wisconsin, similar dynamic going on in Michigan. Right. And um, yeah. I mean, they're they're trying to do the exact same thing, it seems like. Basically, what, what happened, Michigan is like Wisconsin. They they elected a Democratic governor. They elected a Democratic secretary of state. It basically was a, a clean sweep for Democrats. They also uh passed two really good ballot initiatives, one for nonpartisan redistricting and one that would give election day registration, automatic registration, no excuse absentee ballots to Michigan, which is huge because Michigan has some of the worst election laws in the country, and it was decided by only 10,000 votes in 2016. And so what they're doing is they are now taking power away from the new elected Democratic Secretary of State. They're also trying to essentially overturn the ballot initiative. One of the things that the ballot initiative does is it says that uh, there should be election day registration. You should be able to register and you should be able to vote on election day increases voter turnout by up to 10 percent. Um, they are now trying to limit election day registration to only 14 days before the election, which is not election day registration. That's just cutting off registration 14 days before the election. That, to me, seems to be clearly unconstitutional, because you had a ballot initiative that was passed by the voters with 67 percent support to change the state's constitution. Now the legislature 
is basically trying to overturn that law. I am very concerned this is going to happen elsewhere, Sam, because seven different states passed ballot initiatives in 2018 to expand voting rights in some form or another, most prominently in Florida, where they restored voting rights to up to 1.4 million ex-felons. I'm concerned in all of these states that have Republican legislatures, they're going to come back in session, either in the lame duck or the regular session, they're going to try to overturn these ballot initiatives, overturn the will of the voters. And the whole purpose of doing ballot initiatives was because Republicans wouldn't do this legislation. So I'm, I'm concerned this is one another way. We're not seeing this in Wisconsin, but we're starting to see this in Michigan. This is going to be another way in which states are going to try to overturn the will of the people. We're already seeing it in Ohio, where they also passed uh, an initiative to reform the state's redistricting process. They have incredibly gerrymandered maps in Ohio for Republicans. Now they're trying to change the entire process of getting initiatives on the ballot to make it much more difficult to do that in the future. Now, okay, let me just w- clarify one thing in Ohio. So Ohio, uh, the voters voted for an independent commission to uh, gerrymander, or I should say to um, to redistrict uh, come 2020. Can uh, The Ohio State Legislature is not retroactively re- 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 reversing that, is Are they? No, they're not retroactively reversing it. I mean, Ohio is an unbelievable, incredible state. I mean, o- Ohio... Uh, in Ohio, candidates for the legislature got fifty percent of the vote, but they have a well, super majority. Yeah, let's let's in put the this cl- do, do, let's, so let's, let's put this graphic up there um, because because we have this graphic. I want to show it. This is, um, I guess, from the uh, Maddow uh, from the Maddow show. This is really stunning. This is the popular vote versus seats won in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. I imagine this dynamic happens in other states, but nothing to this degree. Wisconsin State House, the popular vote was Democratic, 53%, Republicans, 45%. The seats won was not even just flipped. It was 64% was Republicans, 36% Democrats. This is bizarre. It's bizarre. In Michigan, Completely bizarre. In Michigan and, and, same and I mean, thing, 52 to 47, and the seats won was, 53, was 47 to 53. In North Carolina, yeah. popular vote. 50% Democrats, 47% Republicans, and is 46% of the seats went to Democrats and 54% of the seats went to Republicans. Uh, same thing in Pennsylvania. Even after, is that Pennsylvania one even after the, um, after the, state, the state Supreme Court uh, changed the district? They only change the districts for the congressional races. Oh, right. So the state house and the state senator are still gerrymandered. There so you go. I assume that's for I assume that's for the 2018 election. Yep. But anyway, in Ohio, it, it, they got Republicans got 50 percent of the vote in Ohio. So you'd assume it would be a 50-50 delegation. Instead, they have a super majority in the legislature. I mean, Ohio it, it, it's been trending Republican, but it's nowhere near a Republican supermajority state. And we're not talking about. Um, Mississippi, right? This is not uh, Alabama, right? Oklahoma here, um, but yet they have a super majority in the legislature, so they're going to be able to do whatever they want in the in the next session. Um, but what they did is, right now, to get an initiative on the ballot, you need majority support to pass it. They are now going to try to change that to sixty percent support to pass it. They are also going to say that. If you want to do a signature drive, and this is a little in the weeds, but this kind of stuff has a lot of impact, that if you're collecting signatures to get initiative on the ballot, previously they didn't expire and you had until July to do it. Now the signatures are only valid for 180 days and you have to get it on the ballot beginning of April, meaning you have to collect all the signatures during the winter in Ohio. And if you've ever been to Cleveland in the winter, Sam, it's not a very pleasant place. So they're basically saying, not only do you need more support to do this, but you better gather all of these signatures when it's completely freezing, in the middle of the winter, when it's 10 degrees in Cleveland, the, the wind's coming off the lake, and it's dark at 3 p.m. Um, good luck doing that. So this is like the next frontier. It's like, so you, you, you try to, what we're seeing in all four of these states is you try to strip Democrats of power. You try to make it harder to vote. And then when voters say, we don't like either of those two things, we're just going to do it by initiative and bypass the legislative process altogether, then you overturn the will of the people by changing the initiative themselves or basically making it impossible to do initiatives in the future. I think all of this has to be seen as part of a larger Republican strategy, which is basically just a fundamental contempt for democracy. And, and my question, Sam, is what do you wait, do about uh, a political isn't system? It, where, isn't it where, Donald Trump? Ahead. Isn't the problem Donald Trump? 
Isn't Donald Trump like uniquely anti-democratic? That's the fascinating thing to me is that if you were paying attention to the behavior of Republican legislatures since 2010, what was going on in Wisconsin, what was going on in North Carolina, what was going on in Michigan and elsewhere, Donald Trump shouldn't have been a surprise. Because I think Donald Trump is reflective of a larger disregard for democracy in the Republican Party. Yeah, who do people think? The one. Who do people think are giving Donald Trump these ideas? This guy doesn't know enough about civics to have made come up with any anything. You know, I mean, that's the thing. Is that this is this is Donald Trump is there because it's the Republican Party, not vice, uh, vice versa. Yeah. And it, uh, all right, so let me ask you this: the Republican Party is in condition to do this kind of stuff. The Rep- only a Republican Party that would support these kind of things would vote for someone like Donald Trump exactly. in the first place. And so I think if you really want to understand the Republican Party, don't focus on Trump. Focus on what they're doing where they have power on the state level. And, of course, that then extends to things like Mitch McConnell stealing a Supreme Court seat yes. from Barack Obama. Yes. All right. So and and uh, the, uh, the frankly, the Republican dominated uh, Supreme Court uh, d- smashing Section five of the Voting Rights Act, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I mean, these is these is all yep. part of a whole. Now, here's the thing. And, and he, well, uh, this is, uh, I guess, a, a multi part uh, question. One, what are the Democrats doing about it? And and two, it, 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 sort of a subset of this question is like, do Democrats even have a consciousness of the way that we are uh, talking about this? Like this is a this is not just a series of coincidences like, wow, look at the, what the Democrat the Republican Party is doing in Wisconsin. It seems very similar to what the Republican Party is doing in North Carolina, which is similar to what they did in <laughs> Michigan, which is similar to what they did. I mean, uh, down the line. Right. Um, and um, is it is it because the, the Democratic Party apparatus or the media intel, or, you know, whatever the, the blob is here, whether it's like sort of, um, you know, uh, Beltway uh, journalists or corporate mainstream journalists or however you want to talk about it, um, the media does not seem to like absorb and internalize this phenomena that we're seeing, which is, you know, this was this, you know, Scott Walker was doing this in 2011. Right. I mean, this is this is this yeah. is we saw this happen there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the the failure of the media and maybe simultaneously, I don't know how to disaggregate this, the failure of the Democratic establishment to recognize this is inhibiting a response. Well, so I think there, there are slightly different things, the Democrats um, and the media, in terms of what, what the, the, what's going on here. Um, I think that Democrats just have a fundamental faith in the political They win elections. Uh, that will be enough, even if they win them under unfair rules, which is what happened in Wisconsin, North Carolina, and other states. The political system was already rigged against them. Um, but they fought under those rules, and they were able to actually make some pretty significant advances in terms of winning governor seats and things like that. Um, and I think they just thought, oh, well, we, we won the election, and, and, and we passed these ballot initiatives, and things will play out. And I think, once again, they got caught flat-footed, that the, the indivisibles of the world, the swing lefts of the world, all of these new groups that, 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 that sprang up thought, oh, you know, well, we, we won these elections and then come January 2019, you know, we'll work inside the legislature to try to advance our agenda. And it's like, I don't think people were prepared for <laughs> Republicans just immediately after these victories to try to undercut them. And they probably should have been. And I think that basically... The, the 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 notion is that you can you can never rest that this is going you're going to have to have the same 24 seven movement to try to defend democracy that Republicans have to try to undermine democracy and I I know that's exhausting I mean Sam I'm exhausted from covering this stuff you know, I just covered an entire election defined by voter suppression in Georgia and other states now I'm having to cover it all over again in a lame duck session I mean. I think there is a level of fatigue here. I think people are exhausted. I think that's one of the reasons Republicans are trying to push this through now is to try to do it under the cover of darkness. Now, there, this thing in Wisconsin has blown up. It has gotten a lot of attention. It will be challenged in court. So I think that, that in, in some ways, it, not that it backfired on them, because if they pass on law, it won't have backfired on them. Um, but, but they weren't able to sneak it on it. In, they didn't in, get away with it the way that they... Yeah, well, they didn't get away with it. Well, yeah. let me ask but, you this. But the media, I, I worry <laughs> more about the media, though, because... 
as I said earlier, I do think the media is so conditioned to do both sides of them that they are just fundamentally unwilling to say the Republican Party doesn't care about democracy. From Donald Trump to Republicans in Wisconsin to Republicans in North Carolina throwing out absentee ballots, stealing votes, the Republican Party just fundamentally does not believe in the democratic process. And that's the reality we're living with. And that is the fundamental truth of American politics right now. That is the one thing, if someone came here from Mars and said, what do I need to understand about the American politics? I would say, Republicans don't believe in democracy. That is the number one thing you need to understand. But I don't think the media either understand... Bye-bye. Are you there, Ari? I'm there, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um... Yeah, the media doesn't. Well, all right. Let me let me ask you this then, Ari. Um, why aren't you talking about the Black Panther Party and the way they're interfering with the vote? I'm assuming you're joking, Sam. Yeah, I am joking. Uh, but all right. Well, so let me ask you this: Is what? Where is? I mean, you know, I. I, the, I, I I agree with you with this with this problem with the media. I think. Um, uh, I, we can, you know, uh, press the media as much as we can, and 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 hopefully there'll be more coverage of these type of things. Um, but where where is, for instance, like why isn't there an institution within the DNC? Let's say, like why doesn't the DNC have? Uh, maybe the DNC is the wrong place for it. Although I don't know where it would go. Like why isn't there some type of institutional support to like, you know, come up with? Because I presume most of this stuff, right? was developed in the context of some ALEC-like, if not ALEC itself. Uh, this is the American Legislative Exchange Council, where these sort of like state-by-state state initiatives are developed. Um, wh- why isn't there any pushback? Have you heard of any, any institutional, like, you know, attempts at dealing with this? Well, I mean, you, you, there are some groups that are dealing with this. There, for example, um, Eric Holder is a group that's trying to work on uh, changing the redistricting process by electing uh, more Democrats at the statewide level by pushing ballot initiatives, things like that. I just think the fundamental asymmetry comes into play here, Sam, because Democrats are focused on winning elections and passing ballot initiatives and doing things through the normal process of politics, whereas Republicans are just completely dismissive of the rules of the game. They've either rigged them or they just completely ignore them or they change them in lame duck sessions. And I think it's very, very difficult when one party uh, is is completely opposed to democracy and one party fundamentally believes in democracy that's just such a level of asymmetry there that you would hope in the long term that those who believe in democracy win, but it's very, very difficult for them if they're constantly dealing with undemocratic means. And so, um, I mean, I think they're going to do what they always do, which is, you know, try to, uh, try to challenge things to the court, try to do that. Um, but I'm just worried here that this is dynamics going to play out, uh, continue to play out for the next two years and in fact get worse as we deal with Donald Trump's re-election, as we deal with the next redistricting cycle. I mean, if Republicans are behaving like this now, you can only imagine how they're going to behave when they might actually lose power after 2020 through the next redistricting cycle. And so uh, I think this is all a prelude to what we're going to see play out over the next two years. Well, uh, Ari Berman, I appreciate, uh, I know... uh... (laughs) No, it's got to be exhausting for you. I remember when you were like, I'm going to write a book about the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. Oh, my God, it's all falling apart. Um, <laughs> uh, but I appreciate your, your coming on and telling us about it. And, folks, if you are in one of these states, Michigan, uh, North Carolina, and Wisconsin in particular, uh, but others, um, get on the horn to your uh, state reps and tell them, uh, I see what you're doing, and uh, just Make sure they know that you're at least, at the very least, you're looking and watching. Um, Ari Berman, thanks so much for the time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Sam. Great to talk to you again. Okay. And um, before we head into the fun half, ladies and gentlemen, let's um, let's play a clip. This, this, this clip coming out of North Carolina's 9th uh, Congressional District. This story is nuts. And it is, I, I don't. We, you know, we bundled it together because uh, obviously it, it deals with voting improprieties. What's going on in the state house? And I don't know exactly uh, what the latest is out of Wisconsin today. And I'm also, and I and I did not ask this of Ari. I meant to, and I don't know that he has any uh, insight into it. But 
Um, the back in 2011, when Scott Walker was passing through a host of bills that would uh, get rid of the uh, Wisconsin um, health care, they had a I think it was called Badger Care, and also uh, to essentially begin to dismantle unions in Wisconsin. I think it was 14 Wisconsin state senators left the state. In fact, I think that's what that sign is back there. The Wisconsin 14 never gave up and neither will we. They uh, left the state and held out for as long as they could, preventing a quorum. Now, the thing is, though, is that they weren't going to wait for four years. There was no way to do that. Eventually, I think uh, state cops came and found them and brought them back. It seems like, and I don't know, and um, I don't know if any of our um, our Wisconsin uh, experts are listening at the moment. If they are, uh, text me. But it seems like this might be an opportunity for a, uh, a redux on that. Leaving the state, you all, you would only have to stay out of the state and hide, essentially. You'd have to hide. Um, until Evers took office. So at least there's, you know, 30, 40 days. I imagine <clears throat> these state senators don't want to miss Christmas with their family. Um Maybe Send maybe their family somewhere warm. Right. Pay for all the families yeah. to go. Um, who knows? I'll just go some play, somewhere and play video games. Well, I know, but that's imagine, also that's why like, you probably like, get a red red bundle. Like, that's uh, why you would not be elected. No problem. There won't be another quorum. I'd be perfect uh, once I got there. Red Dead Two's out. Yeah, no, I, I mean, will be back to vote for health care. <laughs> I'm going to go on the lamb digitally and up. in real life. This is this uh, this is like the Fuck, beginning. They found me in my mom's basement again. This is like a like a total early '90s movie, I think, where like Matt's just playing video games and his roommate, uh, you know, gets elected to state state legislature and then his roommate like is like dude i, I gotta hang i, I gotta, gotta hide out i gotta hide weeks. out because i the republicans you are gotta gonna, be me what? what the republicans are gonna end democracy <laughs> if you don't be me for three weeks uh, right. okay i'll be you i'm boring i'm a state senator uh, there you go i want to write that screenplay and Do go it. back in time i want to go to a different run. era where it would be sellable all right um <laughs> But uh, so out of a uh, so uh, about a week ago, maybe it was two weeks ago, I mentioned that the um, for some reason in this District Nine in North Carolina, a race we didn't follow too closely, but a Republican only won by nine hundred votes. The local election board refused to certify it, and there was some implication because there was one area where there were problems. Well, apparently. And maybe this has been going on for a while, sort of sounds like. Um, there was a practice, well, there was a wide disparity in returns on absentee ballots. Like in every other district in the state, the Republican was like averaging around, like I think around 20% in, uh, 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 in terms of what they would get in terms of absentee ballots. Obviously, in North Carolina, where there's been a tremendous amount of voter suppression, um, Democrats have been using absentee ballots as a way of making sure that they get their ballot in, that they know that they can vote, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so the average is, is that they, they're they winning uh, in terms of absentee ballots. In this one district, it was like completely the opposite. And it was a little bit suspicious. And... The the dispar the delta the disparity between the number of people who had asked for absentee ballots, particularly Democrats, and had returned, was seemingly way off. And so, the reporters from Channel Nine in um, I don't know where exactly uh, North Carolina this is, 
Um, this is in Bladen County. And they were tracking down people involved who apparently had been picking up ballots on behalf of the Republican Mark Harris. And uh, <laughs> this is uh, reporter Joe Bruno. This is the uh, interview he was doing with a woman that he found who apparently was handing, was picking up the ballots. So. Are you telling me to tell people about certain candidates? Just, I don't, Mavaker and Harris and all them, that's who he was working Eason says she never discarded ballots or saw who people were voting for. But after picking them up, she didn't mail them. She gave them to McRae Dallas. Did all the people who voted, did their votes count? I guess. Oh, like I said, I don't know nothing what happened after I dropped them off. No. So you don't know of certainty whether they were sent no. to the elections office? No, I don't. No. I don't. I don't know. I dropped them off. What they do, that's on them. She's- <laughs> yeah. I drop them off. What they do is on them. So apparently she dropped them off uh, to this guy, uh, McCray Dowless, and he was the local Bladen County Soil and Water Conservation uh, District vice chair, which apparently is an elected position, Um, has a criminal record. Maybe he made some mistakes back in the day and he's reformed or maybe not. (laughs) Um He's apparently, so no. uh, uh, apparently, this is where she was dropping off the the ballots, and he uh, he's been paid consulting fees for different Republicans. There is now a suspicion that this has been going on for years in that county, and. Um, It, it, they suspect that maybe this happened during the uh, the primary. Um, apparently, Johnson, this is the uh, the the candidate, received ninety eight percent of absentee by mail in votes. Uh, this is in a, a primary. So good. Um, so they had sort of figured it out. I mean, this is uh, the campaign finance reports. Um, confirmed that the Bladen County Sheriff paid Dallas $7,000 uh, was as a get out the vote. This is, uh, I think, uh, in the sheriff's race. So the guy has been doing this in that uh, neighborhood for Republican candidates for some time. Um, there's going to be arrests here. People are going to go to jail and they're going to redo that vote. And... If the Democrat has any competence whatsoever, he's going to go around to these people and be like, incidentally, your vote was stolen. This time you're going to get to do it for reals. It'll be interesting to see what happens. But um, uh, a little bit more uh, sexy, I guess, maybe for the national media than the idea of an entire state legislature saying, oh, we lost the election. So now we're going to disempower the governor and the next state house. Just Damn bizarre. It, Darlene, don't just say you just handed them off like that. <laughs> Got to create an order of plausible deniability. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, it's the fun half, folks. Um, oh, just a reminder: your support makes this show possible. You can become a member by going to the uh, by. Be- you can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Signing up uh, for membership not only is a way of supporting this daily show, but also gets you extra content every day. And sick of commercials? We cut out the commercials for members. So many benefits. It never ends, ladies and gentlemen. Also, don't forget, justcoffee.coop, 30% off this month. Just actually for the next two weeks, 30% off. No coupon code needed. Just head over to their justcoffee.coop. Also, we are close to, what, only a third of the tickets left now? Less than. Less than a third of the tickets left? Yeah. Are you serious? Mm Mm-hmm. 
And after the, our first day under 10, we shot way up uh, yesterday. Really? Yeah. Folks, you got to do this now. If you want to come to the live majority report show Sunday afternoon, January 13th, 15 bucks, 18 and over. Bring your 18 and one day old child to the show. Bring your large adult sons to the bring your large adult <laughs> sons or daughters to I'm the show. Picturing like it's like a like a Will Ferrell vehicle. I'm picturing now. Uh, it's, it's combined with the other one. Yeah. Um, uh, you can get uh, information on uh, the show at our website at majority.fm. We also have links to uh, Michael's show in uh, February as well. Uh, Michael, speaking of shows, today is Tuesday. Tonight, seven o'clock. We're live with. Comedian Mike Racine. We're talking about the mafia. We're talking about O and A and the alt right, and a drug drug cartel history of George H W Bush. At six o'clock, a live stream with Kyle Kalinsky beforehand on the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel. Michael uh, Patreon dot com slash TMBS for it all. And uh, Matt. <clears throat> yeah, literary hangover. We're gonna do democracy and change. Actually, tomorrow's my birthday. What? Um, birthday, man. Ooh, you've been playing it really close to the vest. How? Uh... I will be thirty. So, if you wanted to uh, give me a thirtieth birthday gift, you could be- become a patron at patreon.com slash literary hangover, and I'm going to be uh, researching democracy and change. Chains. That episode will be out this weekend. I'm very excited for this democracy and chains episode. Because I, I stand by that book very strongly. I think it's really important. I stand so by I'm a interested. lot of it. I think yeah. there's certain like qualifications you can make, but I think it's very revealing to actually... It's way more revealing to get into the weeds than I thought it would be, actually, when it's I got exciting. it. exciting. Mm. Can't wait to hear that. The Corey Robin, if people haven't heard yet, it's a very good episode. All right, folks. Quick break. Fun half. 646-257-3920. Don't forget, uh, I'm not sure if they've posted the new Antifada at uh, patreon.com slash the Antifada, but you check it out. Uh, see you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Are you ready? Who sent us this? Alpha males are back. Back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males.